Hello everyone, Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Today I'm talking about mast cells and migraines. Uh, I've done many videos on mast cells, probably gonna keep doing them because we're learning a lot about mast cells. Recently, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned it, I'm learning in this process with you. I think any doctor would have to say that because mast cell biology, was not very well, well, let's say it this way. As Dr. Afrin says, most doctors get about one minute in mast cell biology in their entire training career. We're learning that these mast cells, which are a type of immune cell, have profound impact on a number of disorders beyond just allergies. We've associated mast cells which secrete histamines as having a large impact on allergies and allergic disorders. And that's why people take antihistamines for seasonal rhinitis. We take antihistamines for stomach acid issues, but we're learning that these mast cells have profound impact on chronic pain syndromes, chronic fatigue, uh, even urogenital conditions, gastrointestinal problems, uh, anxiety, cerebellar disorders, you name it. We're finding that they have a lot of importance. So I'm going to show this in the stream. Go ahead and read the disclaimer. No, this is intended as medical advice, just thoughts for you to talk to your doctor about and research on your own. And good afternoon to those who are joining. All right. Okay. So migraines, the topic of today, migraines and mast cells. So a migraine is a throbbing headache. Most of you know that can be unilateral, sometimes it's bilateral, associated with features of nausea, vomiting, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, uh, may have an aura, may not have an aura. The aura is typically visual, uh, but it can be, you know, including maybe an arm going numb, something of that nature, and can be triggered here by foods, histamine, smells, things of that nature. What this slide is showing is that a lot of migraineurs have other mast cell type uh, conditions as well, such as allergies, such as asthma, such as eczema, interstitial cystitis, and irritable bowel syndrome. So uh, we see that these disorders are more common in migraineurs. So maybe there's a mast cell link. Mm. Now I did a, a broadcast on understanding chronic headaches about a year ago, and in that art, in that presentation, I presented this article. This is a wonderful article for anyone who really wants to delve into the nitty gritty of headache physiology. This is one of the best that I've come across. Find that shown stream. So they were in this article. They're really looking at the cerebral hemodynamics, as we term them. What's happening with your blood vessels in your brain? during a headache, particularly during a migraine. And what researchers have found is that there's a hypoperfusion phase during the aura. So you go from having normal blood flow in your brain during the aura period when someone may be seeing zigzags in their vision, sparkles in their vision. During the aura period, there's a period of hypoperfusion, lack of blood flow into the brain. The headache typically starts during that period of lack of blood flow. And then we get this rebound hyperperfusion phase into the brain and the meningeal vessels. And that hyperperfusion phase lasts longer than the headache. And then basically blood flow returns back to normal. Here, it kind of outlines the different phases of headache. I think that's always good to, to note. We have the normal phase, we have the prodromal and aura phase where someone may be having more craving, they might be more tired and yawning, heightened perception, they might be retaining fluid. And then as we go into the headache phase, we have all the symptoms that I mentioned before, the anorexia, nausea, vomiting, sleeping, yawning, photophobia, phonophobia, that's light and sound sensitivity. And then we may have vomiting and deep sleep because we know that rest typically is what migraine patients have to do. They come out of it in the recovery phase feeling, you know, high or low. 
They might be uh, you know, having diuresis, limited food intolerance, or excuse me, limited food tolerance, so they're not that hungry. And then they go back to normal. Now, some patients may have two of these cycles a month. Some may have 14 to 15 days a month where they're in this cycle of, of headaches with migraines. And some patients have status migraines where they're in this phase all the time, which is a really, really not fun condition. I, I love this diagram um, because it's, it's quite informative. Um, and actually, I'm going to come back to it, see if I can do this. I have a lot of slides today. This, this diagram is really cool because it kind of helps you to understand the trigeminal system. Your trigeminal nerve is your fifth cranial nerve. It basically sends signals of sensation for the entire face. That's its main purpose. It does some other stuff too. But it is principally involved in sensation from the face and the head. So as you can see here, uh, where it says V1 or V2, V3, basically the V1 portion of the trigeminal nerve innervates everything up here and your forehead. V2 encompasses down kind of like a line right through here. Usually it depends on the reference, but it's, it's kind of in this range. V3, it's always backwards on the video, is more in this range into the angle of the mouth. Down here is actually C2 and C3 dermatomal areas from your neck. But this line across here is kind of the V3 area. Now, the V1 distribution of your trigeminal nerve, it has a, an ophthalmic version. It also has a, I'm, I'm forgetting the name, it's a meningeal division, I believe, of the uh, V1 nerve that innervates your meninges of your brain. What are the meninges? Meninges are kind of like the shock absorbers. So most of you know that you have cerebrospinal fluid. That fluid is a shock absorber. But that fluid is within, basically there are three main layers of covering to the brain and the nervous system. You have uh, the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. The dura is the outside layer. And the dura matter literally means tough mother in Latin. So it's, it's a tough, membrane that's there to protect our brain. Well, in the dura matter is where the trigeminal nerve innervates. So some of you may have familiarity. Well, I'm trying not to sneeze. Some of you may have familiarity that the brain doesn't have pain receptors. Hence, that's why in early, early neurosurgery, um, at, when they're doing neurosurgery early on, they could literally like probe the brain and people wouldn't have pain, they would just feel different things depending on where they were poking. Wilder Penfield was uh, was kind of the, the pioneers in that. Nonetheless, your brain doesn't really have pain receptors except it does in the dura matter, and particularly around the blood vessels. This is hugely important for migraine patients because you probably feel like your whole brain uh, might be in a vice, might be throbbing, is gonna explode. Um, for the record, if you ever have the worst headache of your life, that's kind of standard in doctor jargon to go to the emergency room. Um, nonetheless, these pains that migraine patients feel in their head, it's largely from reactivity in the dura matter sensed by the V1 portion of the trigeminal nerve. Your All of the inputs from your head in terms of pain go into the brainstem and actually descend down into your neck. That's why the neck has great importance in head pain because all of the pain, as we call them afferents, the pain signals that come into your brainstem, they actually descend down into your neck, cross over to the other side, <clears throat> and then go up to your brain to become realized as pain. Uh, and that's probably why a lot of, you know, now doctors are doing Botox, chiropractors have talked about it forever that they adjust people's necks and their headaches go away. Physical therapists have seen similar things, on and on and on. Okay. <clears throat> Let me go back to that diagram. Hang with me. 
So this diagram from the first article I was presenting, the hemodynamic article, shows that the trigeminal nucleus, that's what's highlighted here, <clears throat> has an, a crescendoing increase in activity up to the time of a migraine. So you can see here that as this person goes through several days without a headache, they may be headache free, but the activity in the trigeminal nucleus is increasing, increasing a lot. And it might not be high enough for them to have the migraine headache, but it's a building response. So often migraineurs think, okay, what did I do yesterday? What happened? And certainly there can be those environmental triggers, yet it's a process that's happening over several days for a lot of people. It's not just an immediate thing. It's been occurring and building kind of like a tsunami. So that's really, really important for us to understand. Now I'm gonna hide that. Let's go back to this one. Mm, let's hide that. Hang with me. Da, da, da. <clears throat> this diagram, and you have the author's information, Specker, at the top. Um, Basically, this diagram is wonderful at illustrating that there is a bi-directional relationship between that trigeminal nucleus in your brainstem and the blood vessels, the meningeal blood vessels and the dura mater. So most of us would think, okay, there's something going on causing my brain to, to have more inflammation, and that's why I'm having a headache. What you need to know, like I mentioned, that trigeminal nucleus, that it's it's increasing through time until the point that a person has a headache and it's gonna drop down and it's gonna do this. Well, that trigeminal nucleus is actually sending signals out from the center of your brain and the brainstem out through the trigeminal nerve to the blood vessels of your dura mater, sending out inflammatory chemicals. So this is called neurogenic inflammation. So we always think, okay, what, what did I eat? What did I do? It may not have been something you've done. It might be a pattern that your brain is also learning and causing the release of inflammatory mediators into your dura mater blood vessels, causing them to break down, creating an inflammatory response as though almost like you got hit in the head. And then as a result, that creates a feedback that then further intensifies the whole migraine process. So I think that's really, really important that we understand it. Here you can see in the diagram, they're talking about mast cell degranulation. I'll show you some other pictures too. But in essence, it's thought that mast cell degranulation, again, our mast cells are a type of immune cell. They're in skin tissue largely, so epithelial tissue. Uh, they're in your lung tissue, they're in your GI tissue. There are many areas of your body, they are in the brain. And they're particularly around your blood vessels in this covering of your brain, the dura mater. So when we have this inflammation or these inflammatory mediators being released, well, that will also cause your mast cells to release histamine and go back and watch my video on mast cells and pain. But that histamine release then results in your pain nerves becoming more sensitive. So I think it's important to understand because so often we think pain is equivalent to the amount of damage we have in our tissues. And that's not really true for a lot of chronic pain patients. Certainly if I take, you know, spend the example I use all the time and I poke it into my hand, I'm gonna have pain. Well, a lot of people who have chronic pain, it can be this vicious cycle, so to speak, of the trigeminal nucleus crescendoing in its pain response, releasing inflammatory mediators into the blood vessels of the brain, resulting in mast cell degranulation, which then can further intensify the whole painful process. Other inflammatory mediators that we probably should bring up include things like calcitonin gene-related peptide. A lot of the pharmaceutical commercials you're seeing right now for migraine patients are uh, medications that block the receptor for calcitonin gene-related peptide or try to attack that molecule. So that is what's going on currently in headache physiology. You know, people take Imitrex, um, which is trying to affect this blood vessel diameter. 
uh, and pain sensitivity, other medications, for example, when people go to the emergency room, they give them dihydroergotamine. So ergotamine derivatives cause the blood vessels to shrink down because as I mentioned earlier, when somebody is in that raging phase of the headache, we have the aura and we have low perfusion, the headache starts, but then we get this hyperperfusion, lots of dilation, blood vessels, raging, um, that's a bad term, but you get it, the hyperperfusion, lots of blood flow into these blood vessels. So they give them dihydroergotamine to shrink down the blood vessels, which any migraine patient feels like probably they need to have happen. This is just another diagram mentioning everything um, I just talked about. If you want to pause it, you know, enlarge it, look at it. But in essence, again, we have the vasodilation, mast cell degranulation that sensitizes the pain nerves, your microglia, your immune cells in your brain get activated. They start secreting inflammatory mediators. And we have plasma protein extravasation or extravasation. Uh, I always say extravasation, it's really extravasation. So I should say it that way. So the plasma protein extravasation then is basically proteins in your blood releasing inflammatory mediators, further increasing the pain response. That. So, what else do we know about mast cell disorders? So we know that mast cells are linked to migraines. Uh, we know that migraine patients have increased levels of histamine that continue to increase during migraine episodes. So they've done studies where someone's in a migraine episode and they see that their histamine levels are increased. And you can go back and watch my broadcast on connections between, I think it was mast cells and headaches, where uh, I talked about pediatric patients in a gastroenterology facility, and they went and they actually examined mast cell density throughout different portions of the GI tract, found a statistically significant relationship between mast cell density in the duodenum and pediatric patients who have headaches. So that's really, really significant. Oh, and I so appreciate the comments. Thank you, everyone who's commenting. Really appreciate it. So they found this increased density of mast cells in the first portion of the small intestine in pediatric patients who had gastrointestinal issues and headaches. We know that migraine patients have increased levels of histamine floating around during headaches. Um, we also know that there's this allergy relationship in that first slide I showed you where migraine patients have increased incidence of allergic disorders, asthma, eczema, things of that nature. So further confirmation, this is a piece of the puzzle. Migraines are not unifactorial, which is why migraines are the second leading cause of disability, second only to depression. So migraines affect women much more than they affect males. It's like a three to one ratio. And 14% of the population has migraines. But when you look at it from a, from a male to female ratio, I think it's around 25% of females or 27% suffer with migraines. And they're a disabling disorder, not fun. So the more we can understand about all things that might be filling up your migraine bucket, kind of think of you know this, this cup. Well, this migraine bucket is getting filled up by environmental toxins, systemic inflammation, potentially food intolerances, potentially your thyroid. I've talked about that before. Um, we know that once somebody develops migraines, they're very likely to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism within four years. So there might be relationships with autoimmunity to the thyroid, blood sugar issues. So blood sugar being high and low, kind of that reactive hypoglycemia, you have to eat every two hours or you feel nauseous because that affects how your brain metabolizes energy and is able to pump out these inflammatory mediators. And then now we have mast cells. So then what's your mast cell genetic tendency? How many mast cells do you have in your small intestines? Are those mast cells releasing a ton of inflammatory mediators when you're eating seemingly innocuous foods? I've talked in other broadcasts about my new intolerance to almonds. I was basically an almond. I ate nothing but almond products. There are reasons for that, um, but that's what I was doing. Well, guess what? Now I have an intolerance to almonds. It's pretty severe. So um, just as an example. So then that's releasing systemic inflammation. So all these factors might be filling your cup relative to migraines, leading to the trigeminal nucleus becoming hypersensitized, leading to 
the trigeminal nucleus producing inflammation out at the periphery, and then that creating a feedback mechanism where then someone gets stuck in the migraine cycle. Um, have you heard of migraines? Have you heard of migraines in the stomach? Yeah. So abdominal migraines, that's pretty common in uh, pediatrics. So um, yeah, migraines in the stomach, very, very common. Um, okay, perfect. So thank you all again for these comments. I really appreciate them. Okay, I think I just have a couple more. So uh, the medical model is to use antihistamines. Antihistamines over the counter, H1s, H2s, um, you know, they're not the cure for migraines. It doesn't seem at this point. Again, think of the migraine bucket. It might be a, a piece of it. I've had patients who start on over the counter antihistamines along with other things and seem to feel better. Um, but the research right now, just so you know, is looking into other types of antihistamines, H3 and H4 blockers as their terms. So the standard antihistamines, H1 and H2, which you see over the counter, drugs like Pepsid, and then moving into like Claritin, Zyrtec, Benadryl, those ones, um, that's all used um, in seasonal allergy disorders, things like that, Pepsid's used for the stomach. Well, these H3 and H4, they're looking to see, will they impact the brain more so? Uh, so that's where the research is going. And then um, functional models, low histamine diet, DAO supplementation. So DAO stands for diamine oxidase. So diamine oxidase is an enzyme in your body that breaks down histamine. And there, I even read an article this morning where urticaria, go back and watch my testing for mast cell disorders uh, broadcast. I showed pictures of urticaria. Think of them as like welts or welts on the skin. And they can give those patients DAO and their urticaria actually improves. So DAO, a lot of people find helpful for their mast cell disorders, including some people it helps them with their headaches. Vitamin C, rutin, quercetin, luteolin, black seed oil. These are all things functionally we use to help with mast cell disorders. I would say what I do is I kind of have a, an approach, one thing at a time, trying to fix kind of bigger dominoes than help the littler dominoes so that supplements in the right concentration seem to help some mast cell patients. Is there a link with ocular migraines? I'd say absolutely. Um, Ever? Okay, so I think I answered all the questions that we had. So hopefully this was helpful. I appreciate all of you watching and uh, have a great Saturday. And I think that's it. All right. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.